talk about glory. Glory to God. What does glory mean and why is it necessary to give glory and honor to God? To give glory is to bestow honor or praise and to magnify. It is also uh, recognizing the splendor and the magnificent that is attributed to the eternity of God. So giving honor and glory unto the Lord because he is worthy to be praised. Amen. He is worthy. So let's kind of look why he is worthy to be praised. Take your Bibles and let's turn over to Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. Isaiah 42, and we'll start in verse 5. This is what I'm reading out of the National. Uh, Version today. He said, This is what God the Lord says He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. And I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeons those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Verse 9. See the former things have taken place and new things I declare before they spring into being I announce them to you. That is much like what we're doing now, we're going through the book of Revelations. He has announced the things to us that has not yet taken place, but they surely will take place. As a matter of fact, they're taking place right now. He is the one who has laid out the earth and the heavens. He has stretched them out. No one else has done that. He has made and sustained everything that is living and everything that exists. So he is worthy to be praised. Yes, he is. If you don't praise and glorify anybody, I think you need to praise and glorify those that has made and sustained everything. Amen. We cannot uh, just say the words glory to God, and not fully understand what they mean. It is, it is more than just a Christian cliche. You see a lot of people that come to church day in service, glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah means praise to God. That's what it literally means. But do they really know what it means? We need to have that understanding because if people really know what they're saying, glory to God, after they leave church, they wouldn't go home and raise hell in their homes. If they was really trying to glorify God, they would think of their petty things as what they are being petty and think about how can I serve this magnificent creator that has made me and is sustaining me and has saved me and will eventually give me eternal life to live a glorious life for him forever. So you really need to know what you're saying when you say glory to God. So the first part of understanding 
that he is the maker and sustainer of all things. And he has left us an example through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what we need to aspire to be like. So how can we not, this is the key, and he constantly tells us, this is, this is what I want you to be. This is the, the type of attitude I need from you, is to be humble before his presence. And his presence is not just in the church. His presence is not just when two or more gather together that I am in the midst of you. Because when you look at it more closely, it goes even beyond that. Because he is everywhere at the same time, all the time. So not just because two or more are gathered together, he is in the midst. He is alongside of you when two or more are not gathered together. When you are all alone, say for instance in your prayer closet, he is with you. Or, and he is with you when you're not being so good, when you're not being so humble, when you're being just you. So we need to truly understand what the glory of God is. And if we can understand that, then we can become better Christians. Amen. As I was studying this and reading this, it, it just made perfect sense to me. And I heard several other uh, 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 sermons from uh, 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 individuals on TV. George Myers being one of them. And uh, uh, this man, James McMinnis from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. And, and it started really making sense to me. And then some of the, the, the things that I would think about, some of the things that would irritate me, some of the things that would upset me, seemed very small. They, they, they really didn't amount to anything, especially when they got in the way of doing the will of God. When they got in the way that they upset me enough or disturbed me enough Amen. that it distracted me from what I was called to do. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for everyone else. When it distracts you from what God has called you to do. And he called you to serve him That's right. and not yourself. So even when we want to go back, and I, I looked at the example of King Nebuchadnezzar, he came to mind. So I went back and I read King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's turn over to Daniel. Daniel 4. He, he, he was a, an interesting, interesting character. The first world ruling king on the earth. Powerful man. And he had whims and fits of rage in whatever he said went. But King Nebuchadnezzar was taught to honor and glorify the name of God. If we can only repent and be like King Nebuchadnezzar, can you imagine that? If we can learn to be like him, we'd be far on our way. That's right. That's right. We'd be far on our way. Now, here's a man that had people burnt to a crisp, skinned alive, mm -hmm. torn apart by wild animals just for sport. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just that he woke up on the bad side of the bed, he could, you'll have 10, 20 people killed. Mm -hmm. Just because he wasn't in a good mood. That's the kind of power of this man, and no one can challenge that. Mm -hmm. So in Daniel 4, we are going to read verses 28 to 32 to give you an uh, understanding who King Nebuchadnezzar was. And this is after he had had this terrible, terrible dream. This is where Daniel comes in, because Daniel was the only one in the whole kingdom that could interpret his dream. Right. Because it was given, the interpretation was given to him by God. Mm -hmm. So at this point, King 
Nebuchadnezzar had understood that Daniel would get the word on his dreams, and they were some frightful things, in which if he didn't get the answer, then it was a whole lot of his wise men weren't going to be wise anymore. They were going to be dead men. That's right. <laughs> so Daniel saved them by being able to interpret the dreams, which the dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar by God. That's right. By the one and only God. Mm -hmm. And so when he had this last dream, he went to Daniel. And he knew Daniel could tell him the interpretation of it. And he gave a little bit of honor just because he can get what he wanted. The interpretation of that dream. You know, everybody have a dream and you want to know what it really means. Mm -hmm. You have all kind of wild dreams and what we begin to to think and imagine as human beings, is this a sign? You know, we're always looking for that sign. Is this is a sign? And what's going to happen to me? Or what should I do? And generally, it is nothing. 99.9% .9 of the time, it is nothing. Maybe you ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before you went to bed. And I guarantee you, you're going to have some crazy dreams. <laughs> Because when I wanted to cut down on my crazy dreams, I stopped having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches before I went to bed. And then the dream went away. Well, imagine that. So anyway, let's start in verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. So he had this dream, and now 12 months later, this is going to happen. As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not this great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people, and you will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle, and seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is Sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with dew from heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle. And his nails were like claws of a bird. So anyway, Nebuchadnezzar got what was coming to him. Because he was puffed up. Yep. This is the way we can get. We get so concerned about our things. Mm -hmm. And we must have our way with our things. And if we don't, people are going to pay the price for it. Because this is me. This is mine. And if I don't get mine, I'm not satisfied with that. And if I'm not satisfied, then people are going to pay. So he was the same way. He didn't recognize that the kingdom that he had was actually given to him by the Lord. Now the Lord had told him this before. Daniel had told him this before. He said, listen, king. You can avoid this because it's going to happen if you would just repent and stop your wicked ways. Yep. And he taking that into consideration until he was out walking on the, on the roof and seeing all that he had and all that he had built by his power and for his majesty. And the Lord showed him, you've got no power, you've got no majesty, everything, all authority <laughs> comes from God. That's right, that's right. And see, we need to learn that even as a nation today, especially here in the United States. That's why the President of the United States gets so disrespected and called such disparaging names and crazy cartoons about this man. No respect! And most of these individuals are supposed to be leaders, supposed to be Christians. But let me 
tell you something. God will deal with you too. Don't think you can get away with it just because you, you claim to be a child of God. Because your day of reckoning will come. So as it goes on for the king, we'll drop down to verse 34. After he had spent seven years living like an animal, living like the beasts of the field. Man, could you imagine? Well, he was probably cold and shivering. He was going to the bathroom on himself. He stuck like, oh, get out. I don't know whether they hosed him off or not. But you know, like his hair and stuff was, had grew on him. He was like feathers. Maybe on his, or maybe that hair on his back too. Or on his chest, and that was all. Hey, you know, he was like a like an ox, like a, 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 a one of them, a, what is it, one of them, the, uh, uh, hair hanging down like a llama or something, uh, or, or, or what's a, a, a kayak or whatever they call those things. He was, this man was in bad shape mm -hmm. and eating grass. Mm -hmm. Well, he better be glad it was that grass. So this, this, this grass out here, I think uh, the, the king wouldn't have made it with all that, <laughs> the pesticides and <laughs> and all the stuff that's in this stuff. But this man was chewing the cud like a cow. Yeah. That was his meal. And God sustained his life through and all that. He's probably drinking muddy water, you know, like the, what the animals mm -hmm. did. Man, what a mess he was. Yeah. So the king learned his lesson. And this is why I say if we could repent, and be and take the example of King Nebuchadnezzar, we'd be far on our way. Mm -hmm. Don't let the Lord have to come to us in such a way to get our attention so we can be humble unto the Lord. So if we start reading in, uh, in verse 34 to 37. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, and I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the power of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Sometimes we ourselves say, Lord, what have you done? Why haven't you straightened this one out or that one out yet? At the time <clears throat> that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. So King was a worshiper of God after it was over. Too bad his son wasn't. But King Canaveral at that time converted. He was king of the world at that time, of Babylon. So it is our biggest problem not understanding how to truly give honor and praise to God. Because that was his problem. After he was humbled, then he knew how to give praises and honor to our God. And how do we do that? We follow the example Jesus has left for us. We forget about his example. We forget about it is our duty is to follow him. We want all the benefits of him. We love being saved. We love being blessed. But do we love being like him? And all of us in our heart would love to be like Jesus. Yes, you 
would. You would love to be like Jesus, but where we fall short, we, won't, we don't want to do the work to be like Jesus. We want somehow, miraculously, that he comes up and shows, in, shows up in us and then all that stuff that we got in us is gone and thrown in the, in the trash can overnight and here we are, spanking brand new. Jesus personified. But it don't work that way. That's why we have free moral agency. That's why he gave us a brain and a mind in which to choose. He yes. said, choose life. Yes. You can choose either one, life or death. So to, in order to follow Jesus and to follow his example, to be like him, we will find what it is to be like him in Philippians. Philippians 2, and we'll read verses 7 and 8. Philippians 2, verse 7 and 8. And it says, this is out of New King James, it said, But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. He became a bond servant. So what the Lord says, he who, who humbles himself will be exalted when he returns. But those who are looking out for themselves and raising hell and complaining, those who want their way, and those who, who will do anything, or won't do anything to anyone unless it is done for them, that is not pleasing to the Lord. That is not a servant. If you want to learn how to treat someone, become a servant. We want people to serve us, we want them to know how to serve us, but we don't want to do that in return. And if you want to do that in return, in order to get this in return, you got the wrong attitude in the first place. Because that wasn't Jesus. Jesus, Jesus had glory. Yes. He gave it all up. Mm -hmm. He became a bond servant. He became a man just like us, a human being. And he served us. We didn't serve him. Right. He served us. He constantly served the people. Even the last day, that night before he died, he was serving his disciples. Where he washed their feet. He gave them then, changed the symbols of Passover into what we're going to share to, today. Into the bread and the wine. And he served them. He also told them as they was arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. See, that's all we look at is the benefits. Mm -hmm. You don't look at what it's taken to get there. Like people get jealous of the next man, what he's got down the street, and have no idea what that man went through to get whatever he had. Mm -hmm. But you still stand up there thinking that you need to have what he had. But you probably, you may not be even willing to do half of what that man has done to get what he has. And besides that, it's none of our business in the first place. The Lord blesses each one of us according to what we can handle. But our eyes is always looking over the horizon, seeing what the next man's got. And you know what that's called? Covetousness. The last commandment, looking and somebody else's stuff wanting it to be yours. And that always has gotten us into trouble. So in order to be like Jesus, we need to humble ourselves and be always looking to serve someone instead of someone serving us. And that's, that's tough for us to do as human beings. Because we look to get out. We look to, we need to, to probably get more out than what we put in. But at least get the fair share. Well, I've done this, and you need to do that. But that's not learning what the love of God is. Anybody can.
can do that. God even talked about that. That even a, a father knows how to give his son a, a, good, a good gift. He said if his son is hungry, he's going to give him some bread. He's not going to give him a stone. And he said even you, being evil, know how to do that. How much more will your father in heaven do for you? And he's asking us to be like him. So we need to be, our mind needs to be focused in on that. You know, if we just focus in on that, then all that other stuff is coming. Because God is going to bless you with it. Because he has never left his servants destitute or, or out there just lacking to be kicked around day in and day out. That's not how it works. But sometimes I think in our minds, we, we think that's how it works. If we don't have our hand in it to make sure we get ours, then it ain't coming. But if you do it that way, whatever you get, you're not going to be satisfied with it in the first place. You don't even want more. Again, that's why I say you need to be satisfied in the condition I have placed you in. So it's not pleasing to the Lord that we think that way. We need to think of serving to be like Jesus. Because even at his death, when he forgave the man that was next to him, because he recognized the Son of God, he recognized the goodness in this man. Although he didn't take this man up to, to, to heaven when he went, but he knew that man had the attitude, and that man is going to be in paradise. I don't know about the other one, with his attitude, maybe his attitude would change. There's a blessing in everything that we do if we can only open our eyes to see it. No matter what you're going through, it is a blessing, it's a joy. I, I first began to understand what that, what that means because I didn't fully accept that. You know, when you're going through stuff and you're feeling bad and that, you know, uh, well, it, it's pretty said uh, hallelujah. I mean, when, when, when you're being down. But what it is, it's an opportunity in which to grow. It's an opportunity to be just like Jesus, because Jesus was the same way. And Jesus never takes a situation and just kicks it to the curb. It is always a learning experience for us to learn how to love, to learn how to be patient, to learn how to be caring for one another, not thinking about your own benefits. What did he constantly say? We need to share one another's burdens. We need to be patient. We need to be kind to one another. That's what, that's what he means. That's the example we need to set. And let me tell you, when you see that example in an individual, especially in Christians and in this church or in any church, people are going to flock to that. Because they're going to see Christ in you. Can they see Christ in you? Can they see Christ in you in everything that you do? Not just here in this place. In Sunday service or in Bible study. But in your everyday life. That's what we need to strive to, to be. Because it will become then your habit. And then you don't have to worry about putting on airs or putting on a front. Because you'll be just you. Just you. Just you. But when we're not us, we always, we, 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 we look and we wonder who's seeing us. <laughs> we want to make sure we're on our best behavior. That's so that means that is not your only behavior. You're putting on airs. You're actually being a phony. That's not you. So that's why we need to concentrate and know that the Lord is with us. 24-7, not when just two or three of us are gathered together. Mm -hmm. Of course he's there. Mm -hmm. But he is there when there's no one else around. That's right. We need to understand that we can do nothing without the Lord. And we are nothing without the Lord. That's right. As he says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 24, he said, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and to be patient, even with difficult people. 
That's what we need to be. But sometimes we're not because we, we, we lose it. As this particular minister was talking about uh, about this uh, 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 seed of uh,
And you know, you've met many people like that. They can be a lot of form and comeliness, you know, be fine. You know, both male and female. <laughs> I mean, just a head turn. And you start imagining, ooh, wait, what could I do if I had him? What could I do if I had her? Just give me just 10 minutes. Oh, Jesus! <laughs> Woo! And then until you get to know them, then all that stuff starts spewing out of their mouth. And pretty soon their hair starts going all over their head. And they, the lipstick knives come off and re reveal all those chap lips and the caps on their teeth fall out and it's gaps and they rot and their breath start to stink. Oh. <laughs> And now they closed and they, they had to get back the clothes. They rented and get on their real rags, which are rags. Shoes run over and they smelling bad. And then they don't look so good to you no more. You don't want them. Get them out of here. That's looking at it from the outside in. But the Lord wants to beautify us in the inside first. And then the outside won't be a problem. Amen. Because I, you know what? I don't want to be like the wicked. Because the, the Lord, uh, the Lord talks about that uh, in Isaiah 26. I want to go over there. I'm almost done, y'all. Isaiah 26. Starting verse 7 to 13. And there'll be some key parts as we go. He said, the path of the righteous is level. O upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our heart. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When, when your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Now, get this. Through grace, though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in the land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. O oh Lord, your hand is lifted high, but they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be put to shame. Let the fire reserved for your enemies consume them. This has a double meaning. Lord, you established peace for us, all that we have and have accomplished, you have done for us. O oh Lord, our God, other lords besides you, you have ruled over us. But your name alone do we honor. So it is what it is saying that if you're not learning then we can also be accounted as the wicked. No matter how much good they see, forget about it. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. I ain't learning that. And let me tell you something. When you learn learning stuff from the Lord, it, it ain't easy. It's hard because it's going away from yourself. It is pulling the sin and all the selfishness out of us and putting his righteousness in us. And we resist that because of our carnal minds, our human nature. We resist that. So it's not going to be easy. Anything that you find tough, that you have and you're struggling with to overcome. And some of the, some of the things you, you know is not right. But yet you do them anyway. Because it is so easy to do them than it is not to do them. But the Lord, he is so patient. He keeps working with us. And all through this learning process, everybody is learning. Everybody is learning. 
people are learning patience and understanding. Some people are over uh, learning to uh, overcome a, a lot of bad things in their life. And we're all working together. This is why he said we got to endure with one another. We got to be patient with one another. We got to share in one another's burdens. We got to lift each other up and not tear each other down. And this is what Jesus was all about. I have not seen that one time in that Bible, including the Pharisees, where he kicked somebody when they was down. As a matter of fact, I haven't even seen him even kick them down. He may have told them the truth, but he didn't stone them. He didn't slap them in the face with it. He didn't stand up over them with it. He told them and he moved on. And those that were struggling, he helped. He lifted them up. He didn't condemn them. Kind of reminds me of the woman that they caught in adultery, which I believe she was set up anyway just to trap Jesus. And he said, where's your accusers now? She was guilty. She did it. He said, go your way. Go your way. And sin no more. Hello. Would we like somebody to tell that to us sometimes? But not all the time that happens. You get beat up. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure you won't sin no more, but I'm too with you. <laughs> so it is not God's way. And I come to that understanding. I say, there is nothing now that can stand in my way or hinder me or make me stumble anymore. Because of God. Because I know it's all going to work out in his wonderful plan. I'm learning and they are learning. And so there's nothing to fret about. This is what he keeps telling us, isn't it? Don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. I am in control. What a great example. He had Nebuchadnezzar there, the greatest man on earth at the time. Brought him low and then brought him back up. He had more power when he came back than he did before he went down. And this is the way the Lord works it. And this is the way he wants us to be. He wants to be that example mm -hmm. of that glory and honor that he is. Yes. And he has given us some of that glory and honor, and we need to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We need to appreciate it, and we need to start living it. We need to be a walking, living gospel. Amen. Because they will, they will see the gospel and remember what they see more than what they heard. So in James 3, let's go to James 3 right quick. James 3, verse 17. It talks about the, the wisdom. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, are we pure? Are you pure at heart? Then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. You see what that is? That's, that is that is Christ Jesus personified right there. And if we do that, guess what? We've got a harvest of righteousness all around us. Like in Philippians 4, these are the things that, that, that we need to, to think about. I know sometimes they're hard to think about because uh, uh, life, life is not fair. It is hard. It is hard and it can be tough. Philippians 4, starting in verse 4 to verse 8. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. And again, you know, like I said, how can you rejoice when you're all beat down? You know, you don't feel much like rejoicing. You don't feel much like saying glory, hallelujah. But when you begin to understand the glory of God, when you begin to understand that he is in control of everything, that this too shall pass, 
that this is just a learning experience for me that I do really need, although I may not want it at the time, but I'm going to be the better for it when, I, when it's over and when I learn from it, then I can rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's one thing he keeps saying to us, that we must be gentle people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And he says, and he says now, he says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. That's what we need to do. That's the kind of things we need to be thinking about. That's the type of thing that needs to be on our minds. And when those types of godly uh, thoughts are on our minds, we are less apt, apt to get ourselves all twisted up. We're less apt to get ourselves all anxious and, and upset and fearful and, and get angry. Because you don't want us to be angry and not controlled. Because anger is going to come. Because it, it is. And the Lord himself gets angry. But it's what we do with that anger. What you're going to do with that anger? Are you going to turn that anger into sin? Most of us do when we get angry. Because if you don't control the anger, then the anger is going to turn into what they call rage. And then rage, boys, don't tell them what's going on. <laughs> And then afterwards, after it goes down, then you're going to say, well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean it, but I, I lost my temper. But it's too late then. It's too late. So we cannot look on life based on what someone else does or does not do. We must understand God is in control of everything and every experience is for a learning opportunity for us. Building the fruits of the Spirit, because that's exactly what the Lord is doing. When you're going through stuff and you're going through a trial, whatever it may be, it is building the fruit of the Spirit. It pulls the sin, as I said before, and the selfishness right out of us. And it hurts at times. Yes, it does. I'm not telling like that, oh yes, it's, it's a, it feels good because it does not feel good. Anything that we do for the Lord looks like because of our sinful ways and our human nature don't feel good. Uh, most of the times that I know that I've been led by the Holy Spirit is because when I don't want to go, when I don't want to do it, when I want to do what I want to do. And most of the time it's not what we expect. Or what we want to give. Because it is tough being like Jesus. It is tough being like Jesus. But as I said before, if we start to focus on those things, we can be living, walking, talking gospels to Jesus Christ. And that is allowing him to transform us, not us transform us. So when we say all oh, glory to God, you know it's more than just a nice, nice sounding cliche, but a phrase with deep meaning, conviction, and understanding that God is almighty, he is all loving, he is all knowing, he is all over, and he is all of ours. Amen? Amen. Amen.